بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We're still studying the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And now it is official. Our Prophet has reached Medina. And now he is safe and sound. He can practice his religion freely. He can preach to people. He can teach them. He can sit and talk with them without feeling afraid of being oppressed or intimidated because of his own beliefs. The Prophet ﷺ, as you may recall, stayed for two weeks in Bani Amr ibn Auf, where he built the mosque of Quba. And then he went to Medina. And as he was passing by the houses of the people of Medina, he was invited to come in. And Allah Azza wa Jal ordered him not to go until the camel stops at the designated house. And so his camel did stop at the house of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. People would have thought that after 13 years of being oppressed, after 13 years of being persecuted and attacked, that it is time for the Prophet ﷺ to rest. And that was not the case. Immediately, the Prophet ﷺ started by building the Masjid of Quba, where people had the chance to perform prayer in security and freedom never practiced before. The Prophet ﷺ immediately conducted meeting after meeting in the house of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari to know the tribes of Medina, to get in touch with them and to try to formulate this first capital of Islam for the nation of the Muslimin. The Prophet ﷺ sent his companion Zayd ibn Haritha and Abu Rafi' to Medina with two camels and 500 dirhams to bring those whom he left behind, such as the family of Abu Bakr, Abdullah ibn Abi Bakr, and his wife and Aisha. May Allah be pleased with them all. He also sent them to bring his own daughters, Fatima and Umm Kalthum. And his f second wife after Khadija, Sauda bint Zum'ah. He also sent them to bring Usama ibn Zayd ibn Haritha and his mother, Umm Ayman. Once they all came back, then the Prophet ﷺ was faced with this community he had to rule and govern so it would be the nucleus for the Islamic State. Our Messenger وسلم, was faced with a problem. This problem was that the Muhajireen, those who migrated, Al Muhajireen came without any financial resources as they have as they were forced to leave their properties and their belongings behind. While Al-Ansar, the people of Medina, who accepted and hosted the companions with the Prophet ﷺ, and that is why they're called Al-Ansar, had all the finance around because they were farmers, traders, and they had things going for them. The Prophet ﷺ, faced with this situation, got a number of generous proposals from the Ansar. Some of them said, take what you want from our money, O Prophet of Allah. Take what you want from our property. Share all of it. We could care less. This is all for the sake of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ did not want to be unfair to them. 
and at the same time he did not want to be de deprive al muhajirin from a well-being life so he came up with the idea that each one of al muhajirin must be a brother to a particular man from al ansar so he divided al muhajirin and gave everyone from the ansar his share so this man is the brother of that man and they all went together they beca became real brothers to the extent that if one of them died the other inherited him and they lived in the same house and they gave them everything in order for them to live normally I remember one story that was so beautiful it was beyond imagination Sa'ad ibn al-Rabi' he was from the Ansar the Prophet ﷺ told him that he is now to be the brother of Abdurrahman ibn Awf and to those who don't know Abdurrahman ibn Awf Abdurrahman ibn Awf was a young Muslim from a very noble family yet he was a wealthy man and he was a merchant when he was living in Mecca when he migrated he had to leave everything behind all of his fortune Sa'ad ibn al-Rabi' was one of the most wealthiest men in Medina from the Ansar when he knew that Abdurrahman is his brother he came to him and said O oh brother in Islam Sa'ad is proposing it's not the other way around Sa'ad is the wealthy man and he is proposing to this poor immigrant who just came usually it's the other way around it is us the poor who seek the rich for some aid and assistance Sa'ad ibn Rabi' went to Abdurrahman ibn Awf and told him Abdurrahman you're my brother all the people of Medina know that I am among the richest with them so this is my money take half of it 50% take it it's yours and Medina also knows that I have two fine wives look at them and choose whomever you like I'll divorce her she becomes your wife imagine such generosity imagine such belief in Islam and accepting the instructions of the Prophet ﷺ on the spot without any hesitation he did not hide anything he could have easily said I'll give you a hundred I'll give you a thousand he told him give get half of what I own it's yours half of it and even someone some of us would find it easy to give away money but to reach the level that the two love of your life your wives you do not tell him which one you love more you simply tell him to choose whomever you see fit for you and I'll divorce her for you even if she's my love of my life just to show you that I am willing to sacrifice my whole life for the pleasure of Allah Azza wa Jal. no one would ever believe this level of generosity and if you reverse this let us look at what Abdurrahman ibn Awf did if I were in Abdurrahman ibn Awf's shoes I would have definitely taken half of the money well the women maybe not but if it's free then why not and they're one of the finest among the people of Medina Abdurrahman ibn Awf was a true real Muslim that would not harm his brother and would not cause any trouble for him he was a proud Muslim he had the dignity and he had the trust in Allah and he also 
knew his capabilities. He told Sa'd ibn Rabi' May Allah Azza wa Jal bless your money and bless your wives. Leave them, but I seek one favor of you. Show me where the market is. And this was a slogan to all those who seek the blessing of Allah Azza wa Jal in trade. Show me where the market is. So they told him, the market is there. He went to the market. And only a few days passed. And he came to the Prophet ﷺ with money in his hand. He wasn't a magician. And he wasn't a liar. And he would not ever cheat Muslims. But he was a good merchant. He used to buy from people on credit. And then go to the others and sell them with a small percentage. And pay the others. And he kept on doing this. The Prophet ﷺ saw him once with the trace of wealth when people dye their clothings in a certain color this means that they've reached a level of uh, of of, of uh, wealth so the Pro prophet told him alayhi salatu what what happened he told him i got married got mashallah tabarakallah okay what did you give the woman as a dowry he told him, I gave her this much of gold, this much, very little, maybe uh, uh, 10 or 20 grams of gold. So the Prophet ﷺ was furious with him. He said, Subhanallah, do you dig gold from the mountain? Is it easy for you just to go to the mountain and take gold from it? It's, it's not that easy. This was a lot. You paid a lot of money because in Islam, the uh, a Muslim when getting married, should not exaggerate in the dowries they pay. And then the Prophet ﷺ told him, then if this is the case, if you got married, then you should sacrifice even one sheep. And this is the tradition and sunnah in Islam. Whenever a person gets married, he should gather the people to feed and to celebrate his marriage with him. And that would be by either slaughtering the sheep or depending on uh, uh, the welfare and the finance available at that time. We have a short break, and inshallah we'll be right back. If you're 18, or if you're 80, if you've been Muslim for 50 years or 5 minutes, this is a show for you. You know, when 5 times a day, I've, our foreheads touch the ground in prayer. We beg for what's most important in our lives. We want to be good people, better Muslims. We want to serve Allah Almighty with all our hearts. In the show Let's Talk, every week we're going to talk about Islam and life, how to relate with other people and how to serve Allah. We'll have studio guests, we'll have a live studio audience. There'll be a, an email for you to write to, talk at huda.tv. So if you're looking for something different, looking for something that will make you think, maybe even touch your heart, this is the show for you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is running the affairs of Medina. He managed to settle the Muhajireen with the Ansar. He brought each one of the Muhajireen and gave him a brother of his own from the Ansar, which meant that the strongest thing between these two different groups was their religion. Shaykh, uh, as we can see in the sacrificing of the Ansar for the Muhajirin of Mecca, so what's your message for the neighbor countries that receiving the, the immigrants from Sudan, like uh, Palestine or the nowadays Iraq? The message is crystal clear. The Prophet ﷺ teachings to us were that all the Muslims should be strong, tight, and together, 
as if they are a building structured by brick by brick. If you remove some of the bricks, the whole building would collapse. The Muslims must be together as a one unit. There's a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ gives us an example of the Muslims in their getting together and cooperating. He is telling us it is exactly like a person's body. If one part of the body is ill, the whole body suffers with ache, with sleepliness, and with fever. So, it is indeed a great role to those who were fortunate and blessed by Allah Azza wa Jal to have the financial resources. But it is indeed a responsibility. If they do not pay the price, they will be punished on the Day of Judgment for not doing their responsibility towards their brothers and sisters who, are, who were forced to migrate to them. This is understandable when we see the lack of support our brothers in Palestine receive, are receiving from the other Muslims. The people in Palestine are starving to death. The people in Iraq are starving to death. The people in Afghanistan are starving to death. The people in Chechnya, there are no people in Chechnya anymore because of the oppression and the racist attacks against our brothers, uh, Muslim brothers over there. And all the Muslim nation are sinful at the side of Allah Azza wa if they do not take me the proper measures to support their brothers. We are all sinful at the side of Allah Azza wa When we look at the case in Medina, we would find that this was not the case. The Prophet ﷺ associated with them together. Each muhajir from the hajirin had a brother from Al-Ansar. Yet, there were still poor people who could not support themselves. And these, these poor people were ranging from 50 to 100. And they used to be called Ahlu As-Suffa. These poor men had only one place to go to, and that was the Masjid of Medina. The companions of the Prophet ﷺ started to live in Medina. But to those who do not know Medina, Medina has a very strange climate to it. Whoever comes to Medina from out of it usually feel, uh, falls sick. And this is exactly what happened to Abu Bakr. It happened to Bilal. It happened to all the companions of the Prophet ﷺ to the extent that the Prophet ﷺ said a beautiful hadith. And this hadith translates to that no one is patient and accepting the difficult uh, weather of Medina. Anyone who does this, Allah Azza wa Jal will make me intercede for him on the Day of Judgment and be witness to him. So if you go to Medina and you find this hardship because of the weather, because of the climate, because of the change of the, uh, the location, if you are patient and you take this with a good heart, the Prophet ﷺ will intercede for you, he will be a shafir, and he will be a witness for you. And whoever, the Prophet says, ﷺ, abandons Medina, looking forward to something else, because he does not like Medina, the Prophet said والسلام, that Allah will bring someone who is much and far better uh, 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 than he is in Medina. Which means that the Prophet والسلام, is inviting us to live, if we can, in Medina. And he's, he's threatening those who want to leave, not to leave. And one of the characteristics of Mecca and Medina is, do, does anybody know? Mecca is uh, um, not taught as Medina. It's, it's not what? Not hot. No, it's not this characteristics. There is something religiously about Mecca and Medina that are more important than any other country or city in the world. At the end of time, 
The Prophet yeah. tells us that the Dajjal, Dajjal can't enter to these yes, two cities. That the Antichrist, the Dajjal, the imposter Christ, is not the Antichrist actually, he's the imposter Christ, will not be able to enter Medina or Mecca. And the reward of dying in Medina is also great. Not to be buried in Medina. A lot of the people, ignorant people, think that if they die in anywhere else in Jeddah or in, in any other city, and then they ask their family to bury them in Medina, that is a great reward. No, it's not. It has nothing to do. On the contrary, it makes life difficult for your family. If you die, you are buried wherever you die. But if you die in Medina, then there is a certain reward for that. Now the Prophet ﷺ saw what hardship his companions were facing with the change of weather. He ordered, or actually he prayed to Allah Azza wa Jal to take this fever and hardship from Medina and throw it to the village of Juhfa, which is the miqat for the people coming from uh, the north of Arabia and coming from the west of Arabia, such as uh, uh, Africa and so on. And so uh, this was the case. Once you look at the companions in Medina, you will find that the only bondage that kept him together was above all Islam. It was the religion that kept him, them all together. And that is why you find incidents where a father may attack his son because of Islam. And this was the case with Abu Bakr trying to kill one of his sons in battle because the son was with the pagans. Abu Ubaidah Amr ibn Jarrah was trying to escape his father, but his father stood in front of him and wanted to kill him. And Abu Ubaidah had to fight his father, who was a pagan, attacking and fighting the Muslims. Also, kill him? he had to kill them. This is one of the narrations that was reported. He had to kill him because otherwise he would have killed them and killed other Muslims. This is not natural. It is because you have Islam within you. And the only thing that prevails is Islam. In another incident also, Abu Hudayfa ibn Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, one of the great companions of Islam. His father was one of the greatest enemies of Islam. When he died in the Battle of Badr, Abu Hudayfa watched the Muslims dragging his father and throwing him in a well. And he did not move or do anything, simply because he knew that his father was an enemy of the Prophet ﷺ and of Islam. Also, Abu Aziz ibn Umayr, the brother of Mus'ab ibn Umayr, in the Battle of Badr, Mus'ab passed by his brother who was being handcuffed by one of the Muslims. And instead of Mus'ab telling his uh, brother in Islam, uh, uh, take care of, good care of him, uh, make it easy on him, on the contrary, Mus'ab said, tighten it up because he has a very rich mother that will pay a great ransom that the Muslims would benefit from. The brother was astonished. He said, you are my brother from my father and mother. You're my flesh and blood. You're saying this? Mus'ab told him, brother, this man who is tying you up is more precious to me at the side of Allah than you. So he is really my own brother more than you are. The things that prevailed at the time was love among Muslims. The Prophet ﷺ preached love in the sense that everyone studies Islam nowadays from the Orientals say Islam preaches hatred, Islam preaches terrorism and this is not the case. It's black and white. Here is the Quran, here is the Sunnah. Read it and you will find the answers to all of your problems. The Prophet ﷺ preached love. He told the Muslims, it is unlawful for you to not to talk for three consecutive days. You may talk for less than, not talk for th less than three days, but more than three days, 
you are sinful and Allah will not look at you. Why is that? Because it's human nature. May, we may have our differences and we may quarrel, but this may not exceed three days. Other than that, it would be a sin. Also, if you look at the generosity and love for the other Muslims, Uthman ibn Affan gets a caravan of 1,000 camels with oil, flour, food on it. The merchants of Medina come to him and say, we would like to buy it. He said, well, I've been offered more than this. this. They five times pay him the amount and he still says that I've been paid more. I've been paid by Allah Azza wa more than 10 times of it. And I bear you witness that the thousand camel with everything on it is for the Muslims and the poor ones among them. True. I'm afraid that this is all the time we have for today's program. So until we meet next time, fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.